and I'm not sure what I'm going to call it, if I'm going to call this series something special, but it's just me meeting interesting HR people, I think. I don't know how good of a intro that actually is, but, but that's the thinking here. Talking to interesting people with interesting ideas in HR. And today I'm talking with Sarah Maximilia, and she has an extended background within Comp and Ben. So this is going to be all about Comp and Ben, and you'll hear her talk about her pragmatic approach to Comp and Ben. And I hope you enjoyed this interview as much as I did talking to her. Welcome, Sarah. And the first question is obviously, who are you? Hi, thanks for having me. My name is Sarah Maximilia. I would describe myself today as a previous Comp and Ben expert, now transforming into a more reward coach. I might come back to that later, what that means. But I've spent probably 10 years in, in Comp and Ben consulting, both external and internal roles, and discovered over the last two years that just number crunching and just process efficiency is not um, really making a difference for the business. So... I've adopted a lot of different mindset ideas uh, by today and worked with more um, modern organizations, more agile organizations to implement a pay model or whatever that works for, for their organization, their culture. And you said uh, coaching there. Can, can you, and you said we, we, we're coming back to it, but let's get back to it right away. Like, what, what is that? And what's the difference also between that and, and what you did prior to this? So if you think of a regular company an expert in an organization, it's the expertise that matters here. So you park a person in a room and say, here's the data and here's maybe an external vendor. And then you need to make apply the sense to it. And then you need to provide some numbers and some guidelines for the entire organization. So this goes out to all the leaders. This goes out to um, senior management and you have certain assumptions and you work with certain methods. One method is being benchmarking and best practice. So in my new world, buzzwords that I don't really want to work with any longer, because what you do is you compare with the external world. You don't really look inside of your organization and say, what is it that we are striving for? What's the purpose of this organization? What kind of people do we have? And what is driving their engagement, motivation, performance, and all of that? So an expert takes really this information from competitors and then yeah, tries to make one model that works then for every employee leader in the organization. So when I say coaching, it's much more to leave this spot of being the only source and the only person with all the knowledge to say, so first of all, what is it that we want to achieve? What works for our culture? And maybe that's just in one area, in one team, or in, in, in according to one process or product. And then we explore together, ideally, by a lot of participation from employees and leaders to make, let's say, the work environment and the pay model that works for them in the best way. So it's much more being a facilitator in that role and being also an expert. I can also help them to say, this is usually used, like this kind of bonus model is used. This is an award structure that can be used and all of that. But it's not up to me to make the decision. It's not up to me to say, this is a model that makes people happy and be more motivated. I think that's a very false assumption. And that's the idea of, well, allowing a lot of people, a lot of people in, in the room to share their opinion. I think that's a much more human centric way. And what of what about those opinions if they diverge? If I, as an employee, I, I, I think I should get paid 100,000 and the company thinks I should get paid 50,000, there's a discrepancy. How, how do you, in those meetings, how do you work with that on those different sort of assumptions that you all have, that we all have, I think? I should yes. be paid more or, or less, maybe not less, but more. I think that's fear number one, right? Fear number one is oh, everyone is greedy and everyone wants to get much more out of it for less work. People don't want to come to the office. They want to work four days or a week and then, and then they want to get double paid. I think this is our first assumption. And this assumption is coming from a very old view and perspective that we have on the employee and, and on the people in general. And I must say, to a certain extent, that might be true. And that might be true if you just take an individual employee and leader conversation. 
we are like separate, isolated in one room. And I'm like, but my colleague did a crappy job on this ad, but still got promoted. So I'm comparing with that one person as an employee. And I call this like the Johnson situation. Johnson is your neighbor, right? The Johns Johnsons have just bought the better car and then just renovated something or the kids behave better. And you're always like a little bit envy and feel like, what did the Do Johnson do? And I should deserve the same. I'm in the same neighborhood. And this is the same that happens in organizations. But the reason for that is limited information. So limited information is I have no idea how much uh, money the Johnson make and how much they spend. Maybe they're completely in debt right now. So maybe they have grandparents financing everything. I always look out for myself if I have zero information, if I'm not included in any decisions. And also if I feel very limited to the extent, what can I do? What kind of projects can I work on? What kind of tools can I use in my work? But if you open it up, if you take employees as people who apply like a common sense in general, then I would say people have a greater understanding what is good for the company if they're asked as a collective, right? If you say, I have 100,000 to spend as a company, we already have costs that are, I don't know, 80. So what do we do with the 20,000? I would really doubt that everyone goes up 20 for me. <laughs> those 20 left just <laughs> that's just on me so i think if you see employees as a group of people trying to work for your company and, and improve the results and improve also the well-being of the company not just their own well-being then you have a very different very different conversations but also the journey is not to start with what do you want this is really that's already like a detailed area. You don't go on an individual level. It's much more what do we want as a company. So, and that goes in two ways, right? Employees are vulnerable and at the same time brave to say we have certain demands, right? For, ins for instance, it goes together with the working time or remote time. Now with COVID, this is a little bit out of the question. Everyone is working from home, a lot of people. But prior to COVID, there was a lot of discussion. If I could work from home, then I would probably accept a little bit less income also because that's just so convenient. So we don't look at pay only from a monetary perspective. It's not just a payout. It's a whole package of possibilities. It's a whole package of like how autonomous can I act and interact Am I really respected for my contribution? And eventually that all should be communicated as one people approach, I would say. And it makes a ton of sense, I think. Uh, it's, it's super, uh, yeah, I, I love the approach. But what if you are a more traditional company, say like you've been around for a hundred years and you've always done, like pay has been done in the same way the last hundred years, like how would you shift into this model, which is, if I understood it correct, like a, more of a transparency sort of culture, almost like that you get more insights, you get more autonomy as an employee. Do you have any tips or tricks up your sleeve on how to move into more of this model versus you, when you're coming from a more traditional way of uh, working? I would say, and that's the same with the discussions today about um, lean versus agile. Right? Do we want um, efficiency or do we want innovation and experimentation and all of that? Not every approach works for every company. So if you are like a traditional company, you've done the same things for years, then the question is why do you even want to change anything? You don't need to change anything just for the purpose of changing stuff. If you have loyal staff and if you feel like the performance is well, then don't change anything. It might just be just um, But if you feel, hmm, something is not going right, then really invest time to understand what is not going right. Are people not engaged? Are people just not thinking outside the box? Are people just really tied to the job description and say, my shift ends at uh, three o'clock and I'm not contributing for that. And also the culture, when I talk about culture, I think culture is a very fluffy word. Um, fluffy coming from a comp band person who needed to have everything in boxes. So my, my world was all around, this is a box for, I don't know, grades, and this is a box for pay model and so on. So now I lost my point. But <clears throat> 
culture. So from a culture perspective is, do we have competition in-house? Do we want competition in-house or do we want collaboration? When is it needed to have like a healthy competition and when do we need a collaboration to move forward? And I think those are just as an example, just a few things to, to think about in the first place. So you said there might be companies that are more old school, 100 years, same structure, no change. It's basically the same. Just because the company didn't change doesn't mean the people have uh, not changed. I used to, and I think we talked about this one point in a previous conversation. Five years ago, everyone would um, group people into generation types, right? Generation X, uh, Y, um, Z, and, and they act different and they have different demands and they have a different understanding of work. And I think we don't see this any, I don't hear a lot of companies and then consultancies talking about this any longer because it blends in. So while the, the people born in the 60s are very much dedicated to uh, I come on time, I leave on time, I do all my duties, right? I have a very high work ethics. The millennials were much more asking for much more freedom, autonomy, and then all of these things. But then the millennials have been also in a position of being role models for the older generations and say it's okay to work less but providing the same output. So they have, okay, so if they do that, then we can also follow in their path. So you have maybe different organizations in this very, maybe you have very different people in this very traditional organization. So you can still include them in the conversation and it's so needed. At the moment, I'm working with a client where 40% of staff is older than 50 years old. So that's a very different target than when you work with a target group and you work with a startup company who so everyone is up for experiments, everyone has an idea and an opinion, no one is afraid to lose something. It's very different. And it's so important that even those voices are heard. And then you consider it because they carry legacy of maybe false treatment. Very special in this company is that every time the leader was wanting to acknowledge something, they received the bonus, right? Like a bonus on the spot. Okay, here's... Uh, 2,000 euro for this and 2,000 euro for that. So that made it a leadership tool that was really misused. So now if you don't get a payment, then your work is not valued. It's not appreciated. And I think you need to take that into consideration, say, how do we work on that based on that? What's the biggest challenge, like in, in your day to day now, working with this question, what's the biggest challenge you're facing? I think the biggest challenge, it's quite a new approach, right? Every time we work with company and we've been come very far, they out of a sudden ask, but what does the market pay? What's the market data for that? And they always feel without market salary data, they don't have any security and they could not be confident going out uh, in, in, into or going into a one-on-one -in -one discussions with the employees and say, we have proven record that you're paid fairly. And this is, this is a very old a, a, a question on that, because I, I can relate to that very much myself. This is what I, I this is how I work. And, and I think many of my colleagues as well, like we, you need, you have the benchmark data, you buy it from whoever you buy it from how can we work with that insecurity well, what can we do instead of uh, relying on that benchmark data how can we make sure that we are paying fair and, and that we can feel that in in ourselves if that makes sense i think fairness is a very crucial fair, like a question right fairness is the beginning of all so who is making the decision if something is fair it's not the expert it's not the market it's the employee and every employee will know another person making more. That's again, we are talking about the Johnsons here. So in the moment, the, the question with market data is always, what do you do when you have results, when you have whatever data set, right? So you could come back to the employee and say, according to data, you are just fine. That's not what they want to hear if they complained about salary before. And then if you say we already pay above, then they will find something else that is not right. Maybe the benefits or maybe the work conditions or maybe the role. And with a lot of, for the past, I don't know, 10 years probably, 
we have seen the number one reason why people leave the organization is not salary. It's like number nine out of all the reasons, even though it might be the only one they voice out. So you have an exit interview with an employee and they say, very proud, I get 10% more in this other company. I'm so much more valued. But the reason they were looking for or even considering this offer was something else was not right in the organization. And number one reason is the role and responsibility. So they, it's difficult in a conversation with an, between an employee and the leader, it's difficult to say to the leader, you didn't acknowledge the report I sent to you. You never say my name in a team meeting. You never, I don't know, I never felt I got an opportunity for growth. It's really difficult to make this unemotional. So you want to prepare fact-based. I have contributed. I did not get, therefore I'm out. So you go into this business circus with the business circus attitude and you like prepare for this there are even classes who teach um, people how to negotiate and this is what you need to use it's a scheme by finding out the right number and I use this in, in a particular because there is no right number there's a number that people might consider fair or not but it's the whole treatment around it that is then perceived as a fair treatment and pay is just the, from feeling, the only thing they voice out. And it's also, and to be fair, and it's a, yeah, something that we have always talked about. It's like the easiest instrument from a leader's perspective to, to keep a little bit of silence and to make this problem go away. Oh, yeah, I'm happy with pay. Here's 5,000 more. No problem. 10 days later, we still have the same problem. It's the same with salary reviews or bonus payouts. A salary review of 2% that happens every year is forgotten within a few weeks. You don't even recognize this. How many people I've met who never check their payslip, who can't even say how much they really make, like to the digits. They're like, yeah, roughly this and that, plus, I don't know, pension, and then plus, so I don't really know. Bonus payments last maybe a little bit longer, but if you have, there's a whole different, there's a whole different dynamic when it comes to bonus plan, um, bonus payments and, and the idea of management by objectives. I know a lot of people who only in the last quarter make a real difference and really go after the miles and then say, now I need to show off in order to get the bonus payment at the end next quarter. Maybe just to conclude, market data is a perceived security. It will make maybe give the leader or HR, whoever, uh, a lot of leaders also push salary discussions to HR only. Oh yeah, you do the salary discussion. <laughs> I don't want to have anything to do with that. Because it's the most difficult conversation that they experience in the, in the relationship between the leader and the employee. So the salary discussion is perceived as the most difficult for most of the leaders. And that's not just the young leaders. If it's up to me as a leader, everyone in my team is a good teammate. They are all doing their best, right? That's an already mature understanding of people relations. They have hardships or not, and then there was another problem that they were not uh, responsible for. So if it's up to me, everyone gets a raise of 5%. But I'm tied to a budget, so now I need to categorize who was on a 5, who was on a 4, and who was on a 1 because I have only so and so much budget. We think we apply a lot of rational if it comes to comp and design, but in the end, it's very emotional. And I have seen this over and over again. And leaders also feel fit to apply the rational when they know, I don't want to, I don't want to say it's a good job, but you don't get any payments because I used that money already for the other person who did exactly the same, a good job. No, but also like it, 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 it's exactly as you say. Like people, they tend to overestimate the importance of pay versus the importance of actually doing a good job with the employee throughout the whole year. And it's so much emphasis put on you do the salary review and you do that properly. And if you do that properly, everything else will magically just solve itself. Where it's like you, in most cases. It's quite the opposite. If you do the, if you do the work throughout the year properly, the salary review will almost solve itself. Like it's then it's just magic. 
So absolutely. Yeah. You know how um, I have this catchphrase that I keep in mind. I stumbled over that from a study that I read on employee retention, and it goes like this: money, project, love. So this is what I keep in mind. So you have these three domains. It's the money, it's the project, and it's the love. And so you can use love as something related to culture, the relationships that I have, the appreciation, maybe autonomy and something like that. Project is really, am I working on a cool task, right? This is really, am I excited for the product that I'm working with or something like that and money is really we call this hygiene factor forever but it is only hygiene factor so if one of those two uh, of three is a little cranky right so you don't pay pay according to maybe the expectations then the project and the love aspect will kind of save you it will kind of still be going on but if you take two out of it and you have only a cool project, but the culture is not really good and the pay model is not really good, I'm not really pay, getting paid what I think I should get, then people tend to leave. So I keep having this in mind and say, just pay, uh, pay, sorry, just pay what needs to be paid. Don't be number crunching on, okay, is it 1% or 2% more or whatever. We don't find people easily today. It's not, it's not this idea, oh yeah, just we have this pile of CVs every time and then we just take it from the middle and then lucky one. That's not how it goes. It might go in, uh, I don't know, in a supermarket or, you know, wherever. But if you work with knowledge workers today, especially now after COVID, where a lot of people work remotely, so they can work for every company. It's not even tied to the location then don't be nitty gritty and, and, uh, and say, I don't think this extra 1,000 uh, should be done today. Maybe if you prove your worth a little longer, then you get it. I think this is also what people perceive as unfair. Common situation, they get a promotion, keep the same salary. Because people say, I already promoted you. That should be valuable enough to you. You promoted me not to give me a chance, but because you needed someone to do the job. I do that from day one. I should get paid for it. So there are some, I think some common sense is, is helpful. I, I totally agree. And then that's also just a, a very good last word, like common sense, that uh, you should apply common sense more often. But uh, if I'm interested in uh, coming, knowing more about this and, and also getting in contact with you, how, how can I reach you? Oh, we will include a link uh, down below as well. But you do yeah, this I'm, as a consultant, right? I do this uh, as a consultant. I work with a um, company, a partner company also in Germany for German clients, but here in I'm located in Sweden. The Nordics is uh, my first and second home, uh, depending on perspective. And yes, just LinkedIn. I'm actually also in this afternoon having a meetup just to explore a little bit more because I'm not the one with all the answers. I think the answers come from the people who work with certain structures and, and cultures. And it's much more guidance here than it's this is the model that you need to apply. But still very helpful advices and also thoughts. So thank you so much for this. You're absolutely welcome. Thanks for inviting me for this. Very fun. And if you like this video, make sure you click this one because I think you'd like that as well.